Their Yesterdays by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Their Yesterdays by Harold Bell Wright. Chapter 11 Success. The world said that he was a young man to have achieved so notable a success, and he was. But years have, really, little to do with a man's age. It is the use that a man makes of his years that ages him or keeps him young. This man knew that he was a man. He knew that manhood is not a matter of years. And knowing this, he had dreamed a man's dream. In the world he had found something to do, a man's work, and from his occupation he had gained knowledge. He had learned the value of ignorance and, behind the things that men have hung upon and piled about it, he had come to recognize religion. He knew both the dangers and the blessings of tradition. He had gained the heights that are fortified by temptation, and from those levels so far above the lowlands had looked out upon life. Death he knew as a fact, and through failure he had passed as through a smelting furnace. It is these things, I say, that count for more in life than years. So, although he was still young, the man was ready for success. He was in the fullness of his manhood's strength. The tide of life, for him, was just reaching its height. I do not know just what it was in which the man achieved success. Just what it was, indeed, is not my story. Nor does it matter, for success is always the same. My story is this, that the man achieved success while he was still young and strong to rejoice in the triumph. The dreams that he had dreamed on the hilltop when first he realized his manhood were, in part, fulfilled. He was looked upon by the world as one not of the common herd, as one not of the rank and file. He was accepted in the field of his work as a leader a master. He was held as one having authority and power. The world pointed him out to its children as an example to be followed. The mob, that crowds always at the foot of the ladder, looked up and cursed, or begged or praised, as is the temper of such mobs. His name was often in the papers. When he appeared on the streets or in public places he was recognized. The people told each other who he was and what he had done. He was received as a companion by those who were counted great in the world. Doors that were closed to the multitude, and that had been closed to him, were open readily. Opportunities, offered only to the few, were presented. The golden streams of wealth flowed to his feet. By the foolish hangers-on of the world he was sought, he was offered praise and admiration. All that is called success, in short, was his. Not in so great a measure as had come to some older than he, it is true. But it was genuine. It was merited. It was secure. And with the years it would increase as a river nearing the sea. And the man, as he looked back to that day of his dreams, was glad with an honest gladness. As he looked back to the time when he had asked of the world only something to do, he was proud with a just pride. As he looked back upon the things out of which he had builded his success, and saw how well he had builded, he was satisfied. But still, in his gladness and pride and satisfaction, there was a disappointment. In his dreams, when he had looked out upon the world as a conquering emperor, the man had seen only the deeds of valor— the exhibitions of courage, of heroism, of strength. He had seen only the victories, the honors. But now, in the fulfillment of his dreams, when he had won the victory, when the honors were his, he knew the desperate struggle, the disastrous losses, the pitiful suffering. He had felt the dangers grip his heart. He had felt the horrid fear of defeat striking at his soul. Upon him were the marks of conflict. His victory had not been won without effort. Success had demanded a price, and he had paid. Perhaps no one but the man himself knew how great was the price he had paid. The man found also that success brought cares greater than he had ever known in the days of his struggle. Always there are cares that wait at the end of the battle, and attend only upon the victor. Always there are responsibilities that come only when the victory is won, that are never seen in the heat of the conflict. Once let it be discovered that you have the strength and the willingness to carry burdens, and burdens will be heaped upon you until you stagger, fainting, under the load. Life has never yet bred a man who could shoulder the weight that the world insists that he take up in his success. And, when the man could not carry all the burden that the world brought, because his strength and endurance was only that of a mortal, the world cursed him, called him selfish, full of greed, heartless, an oppressor, carrying nothing for the woes of others. Those who had offered no helping hand in the time of his need now clamored loudly for a large part of his strength. Those who had cared nothing for his life in the times of his hardships now insisted that he give the larger part of his life to them. 
Those who had held him back now demanded that he lift them up to a place beside him. Those who had shown him only indifference, coldness, contempt, now begged of him attention, friendship, honors, aid. And from all these things that attended his success, the man found it impossible to escape. The cares, the burdens, the responsibilities that success forced him to take up rested heavily upon him. So heavy indeed were these things that he had little strength or will left for the enjoyment of that which he had so worthily won. In the victory that he had so heartily gained, the place that he now held, the man found that he could keep only by the utmost exertion of his strength. The battles he had fought were nothing in comparison to those he must now fight. The struggle he had made was nothing to the effort he must continue to make. Temptations multiplied and appeared in many new and unexpected forms. The very world that pointed him out as an example watched eagerly for excuse to condemn. Those who sought him with honors, who praised and flattered him, in envy, secretly hoped for his ruin. Those who followed him like dogs for favors would howl like wolves on his trail if he ever turned so little aside. Those who opened for him the doors of opportunity would flock like vultures to carry in if he should fail. The world that, without consideration, heaped upon him its burdens, would trample him beneath its feet if he should slip under the weight. Nor had he in success won freedom. His very servants were freer than he, to come and go, to seek their peculiar pleasures. The chains with which success had fettered the man were unusually galling and heavy upon him that day when, on his way to an important appointment, his carriage was checked in a crowded street. The man's mind was so absorbed in the business waiting his attention that he did not notice how dense was the crowd that barred the way. Impatiently, with overwrought nerves, he spoke sharply, commanding his man to drive on. The man begged pardon, but it was impossible. Impossible? Still more sharply. What's the matter? The driver ventured a smile. It's the circus parade, sir. Then turn around. But that, too, was impossible. The traffic had pushed in behind, hemming them in. Then, down the street they crossed in front of the crowded jam of vehicles, came the familiar sound of trumpets, and the gorgeously attired heralds at the head of the procession appeared, followed by the leading band with its crashing, smashing music. As gilded chariot followed gilded chariot, each drawn by many pairs of beautiful horses, gaily plumed and equipped, as the many riders in glittering armor and flashing, spangled costumes rode proudly past, followed by the long line of elephants and camels with the cages of their fellow captives, and, in turn, by the chariot racers, the clowns, and the wagons of black-faced fun-makers, and at last by the steam calliope, with its escort of madly shouting urchins. The man in the carriage slipped away from the cares and burdens of the present into the freedom of his yesterdays. He escaped from the galling chains that success had put upon him, and lived again a circus day in the long ago. Weeks before the date of the great event, the barns and sheds and every available wall in the little village, to which the boy often went with his father, would be covered with gorgeous pictures announcing the many startling, stupendous wonders to be seen for so small a price. There was a hippopotamus of such size that a boat loaded of twenty naked savages was not for him a mouthful. There were elephants so huge that the house where the boy lived was but a playhouse beside them. There were troops of aerial artists who, on wires and rings and trapeze and ladders and ropes, did daring, dreadful, death-defying deeds that no simian in his old-world forest would ever think of attempting. There was a great, glittering, gorgeous procession, of such length that the farther end was lost behind the distant horizon, and tents that covered more acres of ground than the boy could see from the top of the orchard hill. Wonderful promises of the billboards! Wonderful! Wonderful promises of the billboards of life! Wonderful! Then would follow the days of waiting, the endless days of waiting, when the boy, with the help of the little girl, would try to be everything that the billboards pictured, from the roaring lion in his cage, to the painted clown who cut such side-splitting capers, and the human fly that, with her gay Japanese parasol, walked upside down upon a polished ceiling. When circus day was coming, the fairies and knights and princes and soldiers and all their tried-and-true companions were forced to go somewhere, anywhere, out of the boy's way. There was no time, in those busy days, even for fishing. The old mill pond had no charm that was not exceeded by the promises of the billboards. The earth itself, indeed, was merely a place upon which to pitch a circus tent. The charms of the little girl, even, were almost totally eclipsed by the captivating loveliness of those ladies who, in spangled tights of blue and pink and red, hung by their teeth at dizzy heights, bestrode glittering wheels upon slack wires, or were shot from cannon to soar, amid black smoke and lurid flame, like angels, 
far above the heads of the common people. There was no lying in bed to be called the third time the morning of that day, when at last it came. Scarcely had the sun peeped through the orchard on the hill, when the boy was up and at the window, anxiously looking to see if the sky was clear. Very early the start for town was made, for there is much on circus day that is not pictured on the billboard. That, of course, the boy knew. And, as they drove through the fresh-smelling fields, the boy would wonder if the long journey would ever come to an end, and would ask himself, with sinking heart, What if they had mistaken the day? What if something had happened that the circus could not materialize the promises of the billboards? What if the hippopotamus, the elephants, the beautiful ladies in spangles and tights, and all the other promises of the billboard should fail? And somewhere, deep within his being, the boy would feel a thrill of gladness that the little girl was so close beside him. If anything should happen that the promises of the billboard should fail, he would need the little girl. Well, if nothing happened, if it was all as pictured, still it would not be enough if the little girl were not there. It was all over at last. The spangled riders galloped out of the ring. The trapeze performers made their last death-defying leap. The clown cracked his last joke and cut his last caper. The last peanut in the sack was devoured by the elephant, and, at the close of the long day, the boy and the girl went back through the quiet fields to their homes, tired with the excitement and wonder of it all, but with sighs of content and happiness. And, deep in his heart, that night, the boy resolved that he would grow up to travel with the circus. He would be very sorry to leave father and mother and the little girl, but nothing in the world, nothing, should keep him from such a glorious career. The man knew now, that the promises of those billboards in his yesterdays were never fulfilled. He knew, now, that the golden chariots were not gold at all, but only gilded. He knew, now, that those wondrous beings who wore the glittering, spangled costumes were only very common and very ordinary men and women. He did not, now, envy the riders in the procession or the performers in the tent. He knew that to have a place in the parade or to perform in the ring is to envy those whose applause you must win. The quiet of the old fields the peaceful home under the orchard hill, the gentle companionship of the little girl. These were the things that in the man's life endured long after the glamour of the circus was gone. Through the circus day crowd the man was driven on to his appointment, but his man was not now occupied with the business that awaited him. His thoughts were not with the crowd that filled the streets. His heart was in his yesterdays. The music of the circus band, the sight of the parade that so stirred his memories of childhood, had awakened him with a hunger for the old home scenes. He longed to escape from success, to get away from the circus parade of life in which he found himself riding. He was weary of performing in the ring. He wanted to go home through the quiet fields. Perhaps, perhaps amid the scenes of his yesterdays, he might find that which success had not brought. As quickly as he could make arrangements, he went. Of the woman's success, I cannot write here. My story has been poorly told, indeed, if I have not made it clear that, for this woman who knows herself to be a woman, success was inseparable from love. For every woman who knows herself to be a woman, love and success are one. End of chapter 11